in the United States, at Harvard, Northwestern, Notre Dame, and elsewhere, and was Boyd Professor of Government at Louisiana State University for many years. In 1951, he delivered the Charles Walgreen Lectures at the University of Chicago. These lectures were published as The New Science of Politics in 1952, the best introduction to his work. In 1956 and 57, three volumes of his Order and History appeared, Israel and Revelation, The World of the Polis, and Plato and Aristotle. And I understand, as a matter of fact, I know that LSU Press is now publishing sections of, this, uh, of these volumes in paperback. <coughs> Although I can't say that I recommend purchases in paperback. I would recommend you buy all three volumes for your library. Other works by Dr. Vogelin uh, are, uh, I should say, he has many other works uh, in German, which not being uh, fluent in German, I will not even attempt to pronounce, but um, he's contributed uh, quite original and provocative works in the philosophy of history, in the attempt to construct a new philosophy of history. And as I say, the works have been quite provocative and uh, controversial, uh, and I think I, you can say, are only just now really beginning to have, uh, have their real influence. I think in the forthcoming decade, you will hear more and more of Dr. Bogan's work, and you can then look back upon this evening as a rare treat indeed. His topic this evening is the university and the order of society, the first uh, of three or four lectures uh, in our symposium here at the ISI Summer School on the theme, The End of the University. It's a privilege to have Dr. Vogelman as the first speaker in this symposium and an honor to have him with us uh, for the summer school as we did last year, as I hope we will for as long as we here at Stanford. Dr. Eric Vogelman. Chairman, let me thank you for your kind words of introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to make a preliminary remark. I have acquired a grip, and I do not feel quite well. I hope you will excuse if uh, I cannot stick it out for, I don't know how much is provided, an hour or two hours, and we'll see how far it goes. Uh, now, uh, the subject matter, the university of the order of society, is in itself about as hashed to death in the last two years as anything possibly could be. There's hardly a day when you do not get a, a paper or an article or something of the sort in one of the major communi communication media on the subject. I just picked up this. Yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, there is an article by Mr. Nisbet, here from California, on the restoration of academic authority. Uh, let me reflect for a moment on that, so that you can see in what respect I shall handle the subject matter a little bit differently. Uh, Mr. Nisbet uh, considers academic authority to be um, a willingness to submit to the inevitable discipline of an institution and to follow the authority of those in charge, which means the administration at large, deans, department heads, and so on, who have to organize a, a university. And when all sorts of disruptive activities take place, then the university will be disrupted. That will impress badly the donors, be they state legislators or private donors, and it will not be tolerated and be expected for next year 
to uh, an establishment of uh, re-establishment of authority through power, meaning thereby that the ordinary authority, which would be the authority of science and discipline and work in a university, since it has broken down, as he finds here, it has broken down, uh, will probably be have to be replaced by uh, forceful intervention if further disruptions occur. And he makes it a sort of rule when authority breaks down, the alternative is not a lack of authority or the breakdown, but power to re-establish the external order. Now, this situation of a breakdown of authority, which he finds obvious in the last year, he traces back to the 1950s, where, in his opinion, the internal organization of the of universities in the departments and in the uh, graduate faculties and so on broke indeed down, in his opinion, as he doesn't specify where the breakdown consists. Apparently, professors do not obey uh, the rules of uh, keeping classes or uh, doing the classwork or something like that. Whatever is done, it becomes a student grievance. And these breakdowns of authority have started in the early 50s and now come to a head in the contemporary situation with no prospect yet in view that is uh, especially down on the faculty, not so much on the students, that the faculty will have sense enough to stop this breakdown of, of, uh, of authority by proper behavior within the framework of the, of the university. Now, that is, for instance, a view of matters and views of the kind you find, of course, in great masses. Now, I do not want to go into this uh, kind of approach, but when I speak of the social order uh, in, in relation to the university, I, I want to go back to the classic uh, academic meaning of uh, uh, order in society. Uh, because, after all, we still have something like an academic world, an academic freedom. Science is uh, organized within the framework of academic institutions and so on. And it will be good, therefore, to remember for a moment just what academic freedom and academic organization means in the case of the man who has founded the academy, and that is Plato. Because that is not a um, historical remembrance or a spreading out of interesting antiquities, but I believe that is still what uh, is the core of the uh, purpose of the uh, academy enterprise through Plato, is still the core of every university. And as a general rule, uh, you can call an institution a university until you are blue in the face. It isn't a university unless that core is there. So let's first get the criterion by which a university is a university so that we have something as a basis for discussing problems. That is perhaps not too popular because uh, it is part of uh, the academic scene today that there are no objective criteria for anything by which you can discuss problems. But I'm afraid that's what we have to do and that's what we have to start with. If we talk about academic problems, we are first to find out what is the core of an academic enterprise. And that will then deliver the criteria by which we can decide what's wrong with the universities today, what could be improved, and so on. So let's get an academic core. That academic core is um, referring principally to uh, uh, the Republic of Plato, uh, is a um, uh, fitting of the enterprise called academy into a social situation which is interpreted by certain principles. Now, the first of these principles is that every society is man written large. You know that, I believe there have been already uh, lecture courses on Plato's Republic in the course here, and you will have heard that. Uh, the society is man written large. And that is, for Plato, the first principle for understanding society, for good or for bad. If the men are no good, then the society, which is men written large, will be no good. 
And this the men are moderately decent and the society will be moderately decent. So this is the first rule. You can't have a good society with bad people. Now, that granted, you have now a situation in which an academy, which had to be newly founded by Plato, there was no academy before Plato, mm -hmm. has a certain function. And this function is dependent on a situation which formerly did not exist, say, 100 and 200 years earlier. That is, that there is a certain amount of obvious intellectual and spiritual disorder in the society, connected, of course, with the fact that the human beings in that society have become intellectually and spiritually disordered, and the task for him as a philosopher or for Socrates, his teacher, is how to regain personally and in society intellectual and spiritual balance which under the conditions of the society in which these people live, live are obviously unobtainable. Can one do something about a balanced life, a balanced existence in a disordered society? Well, you see, here already are um, decisions taken and directions followed, because you might say, of course, that a society is so rotten that no enterprise of the type of the academy will be of any good, and you might as well not do it. And if you look at Plato's experience that Socrates was killed for his effort, uh, you might understand that he's not too much interested in doing anything about the rottenness of the social and political order of Athens. As a matter of fact, he didn't. He did not further participate in politics. But there is left, of course, the other problem that even when the public order of a society and the great majority of people who are in power and determine the public opinion of a society, are rotten, there are always some people, individuals in that society who don't like to be rotten and who would prefer to acquire something like an order in their existence, something like the truth of existence, the meaning of life, in spite of the general unsatisfactory situation. Therefore, the primary function of the academy as organized by Plato is a therapeutic function to help young people who are in a state of alienation in that society and set them straight if they want to. So the first is what they will call a psychiatric or therapeutic function with regard to young people who are interested in receiving an education and are dissatisfied with the state of the society in which they live. Now, this education has a very definite content. That is the content which I believe also has been discussed here or on this occasion already in former lectures. Uh, the same, uh, is this, uh, set forth is the parable of the cave, the periagoge, the turning around from disordered conceptions of life and habits of life, and the understanding of the truth of order turning around towards the Agathon and the vision of the Agathon. This periagoge, this turning around from the shadowy existence in the case, you see, that is Plato's definition of education. Education is, uh, in a formulated definition, is the art of turning a man around. That is the definition of education. And that has remained the definition of education, latent or outspoken, of course, in Western history, right to this day. Anything else, like pure information to be achieved by factual instruction and so on, is not education. So here we have one of the great problems that in our universities we get a highly developed uh, organization for instructions in all sorts of fields, say on the level of various vocational activities, but the education in the sense of Plato leaves much to be desired, so much to be desired that probably most people in the university, when I say most people don't always think always in the first place of yourself, I'm not critical of the students, I'm critical of the faculty, that the faculty 
I have the faintest idea of what that is all about. You never have heard of that. Now, that therapeutic function is the first. Now, part of that therapeutic function is if you deal with young people who are uh, rightly dissatisfied with the state of their society, is a critical function with regard to society. You have to explain what is wrong in a society so that students, young people who do not have the experience to know what is really wrong and keep on all sorts of crazy causes for their dissatisfaction, at least find out for some time what is wrong in their society. Most students do not know what is wrong, and that's, where you, uh, that's the reason why you get all the fantastic clown reasons the wars in Vietnam and America, the Shah of Iran and Persia, all things which are of any primary interest to uh, the mass of the students, as a pretext for venting a dissatisfaction which is caused by quite different things and which never becomes articulate. So a critical study of the society to make a young man aware of what is wrong is part of that education. Now that what is wrong in the intellectual and spiritual sphere is fear. Now can we come to a principle of the Platonic education that will arouse perhaps not resentment just among you, but at least some surprise and it would arouse certainly resentment among liberal intellectuals, is the difference between science and opinion. What is wrong with people is that they have wrong opinions about what the meaning of life, the order of existence, the purpose of the actions, and so on is. And this wrongness of irrational opinion has to be substituted, replaced by uh, science in the classic sense, the term science was created by Plato for this purpose, by an objective understanding of the structure of existence, which enables you to understand certain opinions about existence as wrong. Because if you don't know what's wrong, well, you, are, uh, um, you will become a victim to everybody who um, will propagate certain ideas for his private purposes and wants to get a large following and you may be taken in by it because you have no criteria for understanding whether opinions proffered by the gentleman are wrong or are, are, are right or where they have their origin and so on and therefore a part of the education that is you find very strongly a part in the Republic of Plato is therefore a critical science of opinions and of the types of existential deformation. You cannot do without. Now at this point perhaps you will see already in an anticipatory fashion what is chiefly wrong with our university. Because under the aspect of education all the things which are wrong must be taught in a university, but not as partners in a discussion, but as types of wrongness. If we have no criteria to classify, say, a Marxian conception or a Kantian conception properly with regard to its wrongness, if we do not have the intellectual apparatus to do that, the mere introduction of the material, say the ideas of Kant or the ideas of Marx or of Hegel or of anybody else, who uh, has developed this or that opinion which is wrong, um, will be completely bewildering. So one cannot have, or it doesn't make sense, one can have it, in, as a matter of fact, one has it in, uh, very much so. Well, it does not make sense to teach all the things which are wrong as a piece of information without giving the criteria why they are wrong. Because from that situation, giving materials which are wrong, opinions, ideas, 
without criteria that enable you to decide why they are wrong, that opens them the way to the ulterior claim that every opinion should be represented in a university in the name of academic freedom. That, of course, is the exact, the, the exact opposite of academic freedom in the platonic sense. Because academic freedom in the platonic sense means the culture of reason that provides you with the criteria for understanding wrong opinions and not the propagation of wrong opinions in the institution of the academy. <laughs> the purpose of the academy is precisely to get them out of your existence, not to introduce you to them. Now, one of the defects of our university today, I come later into other problems, is that under this aspect, very few of our universities with regard to that core, are universities at all, least of all the so-called great universities, the famous top ten, mm -hmm. but they are, by public declaration, as you can re read it, every day in the newspapers, when a case of academic freedom comes up, brothels of opinion. The opinions being advanced by people who do not have any rational culture and do not possess the uh, intellectual in instrument of reason to criticize an idea, because they have never learned it. So if you get, for instance, famous cases which recently have agitated California, of oh, should the Marxists be allowed to propagate Marxism in um, the castle? The answer is, of course, no, that's not the purpose of university. But then should such a person, for that reason, be removed from the university? Again, I would say no. The reason why the person should be removed is a quite different one, because he is professional incompetent. Anybody who propagates an opinion in good faith in the university without knowing the intellectual criteria for right or wrong of opinion, is an intellectual crook or mountebank. Let's be clear about that. Now it is taboo to say these things because I do not want to engage in uh, arbitrary estimates, but I would suggest the percentage of this type of crooks and mountebanks in our college population, meaning the faculty, is very high. There you Who do not know what they are talking about. Now, so the purpose is to teach the difference between science and opinion. To teach types of deformed existence. To give types of opinions, which of course today would be different opinions from the opinions analyzed by Plato, so in some kind of cases, we still have the same one. One of the most important opinions, for instance, analyzed by Plato and shown why it is wrong, is the idea that society can be based on free agreement or free contractual relations between individuals. A problem that has, again, come to the fore in the uh, 17th century through uh, Hobbes and Locke and so on. And that is a, one of the wrong opinions that can work horrible havoc. If you're interested in these matters, read the book two of the Republic and inform yourself why societies cannot be based on the construction of contractual relations between individuals. Very important to know. Very important. Especially for social factors. Not referring to you, I always tax that. Is, of course you don't know much, because you haven't learned much. But the real problem in the university is other faculty, not the students. The students I've always found are quite willing to learn. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult once they are exposed for a number of years to that disrupt, uh, this integrated intellectual environment, uh, still to influence them at all. Because first of all, in order to 
be disrupted by such an environment, you must acquire the uh, language of this organization. And one of the most difficult things is to get a man who talks in ideological cliché again to learn English. Because they've never heard of such a problem, that one has to know English, or if you're French, French, and cannot express yourself in ideological cliché, because then you have lost the contact with reality. So it's very difficult. So what is the purpose of such an organization which has resulted in the creation of ethics as a science, in the Aristotelian case, politics as a science, then in the psychology as science of passions and so on, all necessary for understanding the structural reality surrounding you. And uh, what is now the purpose which an uh, academy or university with such an academic core possibly can have? The first is to counteract existential disorder, what today is usually called alienation, by education. That is first, what I refer to as the therapeutic one. And then, in a society which is beyond the period of the mythical cult society of the Greek polis that exploded in the 5th century, and in the 4th century we are already down now, in the time of Plato, to uh, the intellectual, this only intellectually disordered society, to serve in a society which is uh, plagued by intellectual disorder as an instrument of cultural balance. That is, you cannot abolish the disorder in the society. The disorder in the society goes on. But you can balance the tendency to disorder and the active forces on this, of disorder by uh, providing at least the understanding of what rational balance is for those who are able and willing to take it. And then hopefully expect those who can take it, who will become educated, to become influential in society and do something uh, to uh, improve, at least to a small degree, the disorder in the direction of order. That is all you can expect of a university in, under such circumstances. Um, I'm very cautious about uh, such uh, formulations because, in the case of Plato, he was of the opinion that nothing could say that. And he was right, ten years after his death, uh, Athens was conquered by the Macedonians, and that was the end of Athenian independence and culture. Uh, I don't think we are yet that far in our process of disintegration, and a university still could have a function. Only to a large extent it does not have this function, and the principal reason is that people don't know that such a function exists and what it should be. Then you get university presidents who uh, uh, say, who was that uh, Berkeley president who invented the uh, multiversity instead of the university? Yeah. Well, if you uh, get a university presidents who can indulge in such punning cliches, okay, you might say there are in philosophical matters which are at stake in such a problem. Okay? Functionally illiterate. They don't know what's going on. And make a mess of the institution of which they are present. Well, you had similar problems recently. The, you had a, a president of Vanderbilt University by the name of Hurd, who was appointed by President Nixon for a committee to explain what could be done to uh, diminish the student unrest. Well, and what does he suggest? Of all the grotesque things, stop the war in Vietnam. As if that existence of such a lousy university would faintly compare in importance with an event as a war, like a war. The loss of reality. Hmm? <laughs> what goes on in a head who can pronounce these words? You see? <laughs> there, are, there are people dying in a war. 
and millions of people are dependent on the outcome of this war and the process of repression and refugees and so on. And there comes the university president and says, stop the war so that we have peace on the campus. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Now, this kind of idiot operate our big universities. <laughs> Don't forget. Hmm? I'm uh, quite outspoken about this matter, you see, because um, <laughs> I, don't, uh, I have gone through these problems of the uh, case of national socialism in Europe, you see. And I draw the line at murder. When, for instance, we take another case of a famous university in Yale. There you have a case of some black man being sadistically murdered and dumped in a swamp, and some other black man suspect and charged with the murder and going to trial. And then you have an enormous uproar, uproar in New Haven, where Yale University is located, on the part of the president, the students, the faculty, that something must be done to protect people who are charged with murder from the consequences of their alleged act. You see, I'm much more careful than President Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> to protect. Well, there you see where that ideological procedure of starts getting you. If you put it down to reality, in terms of reality, it means that the president, the faculty, and the student body of Yale has come out as accomplices after the fact in support of the That's the sort of thing it is. And again, that must not be said in public. You see, the hypocrisy is fantastic in such matters. And I hope Yale, you will uh, recognize Yale to be one of the better universities in this country. <laughs> that is what you get in reality. That is the National Socialist principle, protects the criminal, prosecutes the victim. That was the good principle of justice. That is advocated by the University of Yale on all levels of administration faculty. So there is no sense in mincing words because these things are going on and they can become very ugly in the years to come because these people who are unusually insensitive to the reality that surrounds it, I mean, we're talking of administrators and some professors, and are very stupid and very ignorant, may produce in the end, or cause to happen, things of major catastrophic violence by stupidity and ignorance. I do not mean to say, of course, that the president of Yale really comes out in support of sadistic murder, but I say that he is unimaginative and remote from reality enough not even to be aware of what he is doing when he says such things. And that is just as bad as you did it yourself. Well, have you got that clear? Now, the core of university, let me conclude this part, has remained identically the same, the one which I try to explain here justifying its organization and expense, and if that core is lost, if there is no justification for the expense. Mm -hmm. If, for instance, this is one quite good remark here by Lisbeth, uh, if you make the university a microcosm of society, one of the slogans advocated by certain revolutionary students, the university should be a microcosm of society. That means it should be exactly as rotten as the society, which it is supposed to balance. Then you would have an institution that is uh, neither useful for any purpose in society, nor is it worth the expense. And sooner or later, the people who pay the money will find that out. They will close it down. 
Now, let me get into peripheral problems. Because not everything that's wrong today, we have to come back to the core problem, not everything that is wrong today is due to a forgetfulness about the core, but there are other problems. The, I'm not going to uh, give you now a history of universities, that is of course impossible, but I want to bring to your attention the accretions to the university apparatus during, say, the last 100 years until they have become what they are today. You have taken over from the Middle Ages certain fundamental areas of knowledge represented by scholars dealing with these matters, such as the law schools, the medical schools, theology faculties, liberal arts faculties. You need theology faculties and liberal arts faculties in order to get the clerics, the clerics in the medieval sense, who are the civil service personnel for church and kings. So what today is a civil service personnel is educated in theology and uh, uh, liberal arts and later in law. So these are the old schools. These vocational schools still are there, with the exception of the theological faculties, usually because as a political principle of separation of uh, the church from the state is interpreted to mean that the American people, and especially young people, must be kept in ignorance about the problems of the church and the relation to the religious, which is a very odd interpretation of the political principle of the, of the separation of church and state. So uh, you get sometimes now cases which possibly will come in the long run to the Supreme Court where, um, I believe here in the uh, Berenger area, uh, a couple didn't want to send its children to the public schools because the public schools, under the principle of separation of church and state, not only separate church and state, but have personnel which is antagonistic to the spiritual order represented by Christianity. They are anti-Christian. And they do not want to have their children uh, educate the anti-Christian teachers. So anti-Christianity, the secular uh, thought, is a religion which should not be supported by the government either, not more than churches, is the thesis of that case. That may become interesting when these cases multiply. Now, these are the old schools. Then, in addition, we have since the 17th century, gradually go getting going into the, into the universities, first being uh, organized outside the universities in academies and so on, the natural science. And you have gradually natural science faculties and departments in the universities, such as uh, mathematics, biology, physics, chemistry, and so on. They become part of a university because you need all these things as the basis today for an industrial uh, civilization, that's the society and the function. You must have uh, the knowledge of these matters. Then, on a more humble level, that uh, well, was very important in the America of the 19th century, the origin of the land grant colleges, where under frontier conditions, you have to have certain vocational knowledges, which did not go into law, medicine, and so on, but you have then organized for this purpose with state land grants agricultural and mechanical colleges. That also is the core today still of many state universities. And then, beginning with the late 19th century, you gradually get into the universities such sciences as political science, sociology, psychology, economics, business schools, and so on. And then also, not to forget, certain cultural activities such as philosophy, the classics, languages, history of literature, history of art, and so on. All that has accumulated in a vast body of universities, so that the university as a whole has become something like a uh, more or less indiscriminate service organization in which you can find information on various special fields of science, practically every one that is of major importance in the major universities. Now, there's nothing wrong with that development. It's very good to have such organizations, but uh, they don't add up to a university. They add up to a heap of specialized knowledge. And uh, the function of the university, that educational function, what we just talked, 
the academic core, is not contained anywhere in these methods. Because if you take, for instance, the thing that would be most important in philosophy, you have, of course, especially smaller colleges, they still have people who are fairly well trained in philosophy and know what they are talking about. You see? But you have huge universities, I will not name any names, where you get a department of ten full professors in philosophy, of who all ten of them are specialists in formal logic and symbolic logic, and none of them has the faintest idea what philosophy is all about. So in such famous universities, you cannot learn anything about philosophy because the full professors of philosophy are ignorant with regard to philosophy. Because logic is a very humanly peripheral, specialized area in philosophy, and you don't get anywhere in philosophy in the understanding of problems of existence. Say if you want to compare a Platonic problem of existence being in the Testament problem of existence or an Egyptian problem of existence, you don't get anywhere with formal logic or with British analysis. But you have to know your stuff, and these people don't know it. Then, we have certain organizational deformations which are resulting in difficulties. You have, for instance, the college and the graduate school. The graduate school gradually built on top of the college, and the relation of both of them together, which are called the university, to the high school organization. Now you have that problem in the college organization, especially in the American, it's not as bad in that respect in Europe, that you get on the level of college education a lot of subject matter which should have been taught in high school and cannot be taught in high school because the American Education Association is one of the most horribly illiterate bunch of people who do not know in the faintest how to run a high school, what in a high school should be taught, and how it should be taught. You can read every day in various newspapers that they still make experiments how to teach children to read. A problem that has been solved, say, by the Egyptians in the third millennium BC. <laughs> Only they don't know it. You or you have highly literate populations of innocuous small nations like Denmark or Holland or Switzerland. And not a single one of these persons would ever dream, say, of spending a summer for a change in Holland or Switzerland and or Denmark and find out how they make it that the whole Swiss and Danish and Dutch people are literate when they come out of high school. It can obviously be done, but not by members of the American Education Association. So here we have a politically corrupt sector in society which prevents systematically the education of teachers for the purpose of teaching students. A lot of political influence is connected with this. Mm -hmm. I found, for instance, in states where you wouldn't be believe it or suspect it. And I was the last time in Harvard, I had a sister uh, who came from Vermont, and to him I uh, know a lot of, uh, owe a lot of information about the education system in Vermont. That the teachers in Vermont, for instance, have never gone to a college, but they have gone to teachers' education schools in Vermont, where they learn how to teach a subject matter without ever learning the subject matter itself. Now you can imagine what kind of an education the children get. By teachers who have never learned any subject matter even in a college. Now, this sort of any place, which again are taboo in public debate, because too many group politicians live on it, 